Welcome to a popular history of unpopular things, a mostly scripted podcast that makes history more fun and accessible. My kind of history is the unpopular stuff. Disease, death, and destruction. I like learning about all things bloody, gross, mysterious, and weird. And speaking of gross, today's episode is all about what's known as the Rainbow Valley on Mount Everest. It's essentially a frozen graveyard filled with the bodies of dead mountaineers who didn't make it. Why Rainbow Valley? Well, stick around, because I'll get into that a little bit later on. Now, Mount Everest is the highest peak in the world, and I'm being really particular with my words here because there are technically mountains that are taller than Mount Everest, but a good chunk of them start below sea level. Mauna Kea in Hawaii is technically the biggest mountain in the world, measuring in at 33,000 feet from base to top. But if we're talking about the tallest peak in the world, it's Mount Everest, hands down, sitting at 29,000 29 feet, or 8,848 meters above sea level, and that is just an unfathomable height. That's more than 10 times taller than the highest building in the world, which is the Burj Khalifa in Dubai. Now, scaling this impossibly tall peak can take up to two months. You don't just roll up to the mountain, walk a little bit, take some selfies, and then come back down, right? It's a whole process that involves acclimatizing your body to the different altitudes, waiting for dangerous weather to pass, and then the hike itself, which is not as far as you might think. From base camp to the peak, at least on the south face of the mountain, it's approximately 42.75 miles, which is 68.7 kilometers. It's not the distance that's the biggest challenge is what I'm getting at here. It's the acclimatization, acclimatizing your body to the environment. But just think for a moment. Spending up to two months hiking up the world's highest peak. Think of the opportunities for gross. <laughs> right? The trash that must be up there, the feces we've carelessly abandoned on the mountain, the bodies that get left behind, the ones who don't make it all the way up to the top, they make up what's called the Rainbow Valley. It's a grisly reminder to the almost 800 people a year who attempt to reach the summit and almost 100,000 people who go to base camp. Mount Everest is no joke. But first, just because it's cool, let's talk about the history of climbing Mount Everest. So as the story goes, the first people to reach the summit of Mount Everest were Tenzing Norgay, who was a Tibetan Sherpa, and Sir Edmund Hillary, a New Zealand mountaineer and explorer. On May 29, 1953, they managed to get to the top from the South Coal Route, the route that approaches Everest from the south face of the mountain that goes through Nepal. The other route is the north face that you can get through by reaching, or you can get to um, by going through Tibet. Though the first successful summit was documented in 1953, that was not the first attempt at getting to the top. Now, in 1920s, the British Mount Everest expedition sent out a handful of expeditions to reach the top of Mount Everest. And unlike most ascents, which come from the south side through Nepal, this was from the north side in Tibet. At the time, Nepal was closed to Western foreigners, so the expeditionaries really didn't have a choice anyway. In 1921, a reconnaissance mission scoped out the area for the easiest route, coming from the north, and in 1922, they attempted the summit. British explorer George Mallory, who was a teacher and a mountaineer, was one of 13 British participants, though there were also a lot of Nepalese and Tibetan guides, cooks, porters. A porter is someone who will carry your stuff for you. In all, it was a party of 160 men. Long story short and simplified, the 1922 expedition was not successful. And in their third attempt in 1922, because you, you can attempt the peak multiple times, they accidentally triggered an avalanche, killing nine of the Sherpas in the group. The first people to die trying to summit Mount Everest. And though the expedition was not successful in getting to the top, they did break some records in the heights they managed to reach. George Mallory went on a tour afterward, trying to raise awareness, but also funds, for another hike. And when asked why he wanted to climb Mount Everest when nobody else has done so, he responded with the now famous line, Because it is there. I love that. Why do you want to climb it? Because it's there. That's the true spirit of an adventurer and a mountaineer. Mallory and other expeditionaries, including his partner Andrew Sandy Irvine, he went by Sandy, went back in 1924, again trying to reach Everest from the north side. 
Unfortunately, the pair were last sighted about 800 vertical feet from the summit, but they disappeared. Mallory's body was discovered by an American mountaineer on May 1st, 1999, which is 75 years after he died. Whether or not Mallory and Irving were the first to reach the summit is still unknown, actually. But researchers and documentarians have been trying to figure this out because apparently Irving kept a camera on him, right? And if they could find that camera and it still had usable film, like, I don't know, if I made it to Everest and I had a camera, I would take a picture from the summit. So they'd be able to find out if they could find that camera. There's even a Nat Geo documentary about Mallory and Irvine. It's called Lost on Everest. You can currently find it on Disney+. Plus. To this day, spoiler, by the way, to this day, Irving's body has never been found, only Mallory's. So if they could ever find this, and if they could ever find the camera, and if the film is still good, I don't know, maybe we'll have to change our story. But since the 1921 reconnaissance trip, that very first one to attempt to get to the peak, there have been countless expeditions to the summit of Everest. And to this day, over 6,000 people have reached the summit of Mount Everest. Some have done it multiple times. It should be no surprise that the ones who have made the most trips to the top are the Sherpas that lead the explorers. Currently at the top spot is Kami Rita Sherpa. He's got 28 successful summits. Which is pretty awesome. Now, if you wanted to climb Mount Everest, you can't just show up and expect to be allowed on the mountain. Right? First, you need to secure a permit. There are two main routes to climb Everest. You've got the South Coal Route, which approaches the summit from the south face of the mountain through Nepal, and then you've got the Northeast Ridge Route, which comes from the north face of the mountain through the Tibetan region of China. And there are like 18 other named routes, but almost all climbers use either the South Coal Route or the Northeast Ridge Route. I'll go over both, though most of my episode today, to be honest, will be about the South Coal Route through Nepal, as it's the easier of the two and gets the most amount of foot traffic. So like I said, you need a permit to climb Mount Everest, and it is expensive, by the way. To get a permit from the Nepalese government, prepare to spend up to, and maybe beyond, $50,000. Some people will raise money through sponsorships to go. Others just happen to have that kind of cash floating around. I mean, I guess if you're a long-term mountaineer and explorer and adventurer, this, I mean, th this is a big deal, right? So some people save up for a long time to be able to afford this trip. The price, by the way, the 50000 plus or minus, also includes the money that you need to set aside for hiring a Sherpa, uh, a trash deposit fee, I'll get into that later, and a few other bits and bobs. Now, the Sherpa people are an ethnic group that live in both Nepal and Tibet, and they're dotted around the Himalaya mountains. Some also live in Bhutan, as well as in the Darjeeling region of eastern India. Now, because they live in the mountains, they are known for being excellent mountaineers, you know, people that go up and down the mountain as a career. And many make their living being guides up to Everest and the other peaks in the region, like Lhotse, which is the fourth highest peak in the world. It's literally next to Everest. <laughs> you almost climb Lhotse in, in the way to get up to Everest. The Sherpa are actually pretty cool. Uh, they don't typically use last names. That's not culturally something that they have. But of course, governments and census takers really like last names, surnames, right? So they were all given the last name of Sherpa because they're the Sherpa people. So many Sherpa peoples would be called like Kami Rida Sherpa or Namgyal Sherpa. So that's kind of cool. They all share a last name. It's their ethnic group, it's their last name, and it's also their profession because the word Sherpa is now basically synonymous with a Mount Everest guide. So, I don't know, I find that kind of cool. So, that first expedition up to Everest in 1921 was done from the north face of the mountain. That's the route that comes through Tibet, which is an autonomous region in China. An autonomous region means that it's still owned by another country. In this case, Tibet is owned by China. But they get to control a few things, like education, some language policies, you know, a few, a few minor, I suppose, uh, details. But they're still controlled by China's Communist Party and are expected to adhere to all of the party lines. Hiking Everest from the north means that you start at the Tibetan base camp, which is at 17,000 feet, give or take, couple of feet, 5,182 meters. And from there, hikers he head to what they call the advanced base camp before heading north uh, to the North Coal. A coal, by the way, C-O-L is how it's spelled, coal. It is the lowest point of a ridge that sits between two peaks. So imagine you've got two peaks, right? The ridge that kind of connects those peaks, 
uh, the peaks, the southern portion is known as a coal. The ridge, that coal, is usually the route you would take if you're going from one peak to the next. But a lot of times, the coal is super craggy or covered in rock and snow. Like, it could be really, really steep, like a steep ridge, and it's kind of hard to hike. But to reach the, the, the summit of Everest, you either need to walk across the North Coal or the South Coal. Now, from the North Coal, which you get to from the north side of the mountain, so from, from Tibet, you head up to Camp 2, then Camp 3, and you keep climbing up from there until you reach what are called steps. And I'm not talking the geographic steps. They just call it, like, the first step, the second step, like, because they look like steps. And then once you get to this point, you just keep climbing that ridge until you get the top. Problem is, though, with the north side of the mountain, vicious winds. Uh, it's quite dangerous because the winds are pretty consistent. Um, so it's, it's quite a difficult route. Now on the other side of the mountain is the South Coal route, which you can access by going through Nepal. And this is the route, like I said, that most climbers take, and the one that I'm going to explore in more detail, because the stories that we talk about today are all going to be from that, from that South Coal route. So you start the whole experience by flying into the Lukla airstrip, which is about 9,383 feet above sea level, which is 2,860 meters. From there, from the airstrip, it's a four to six day hike to get to the Nepalese base camp, which is 24 miles away. Now, if you're rich and fancy, you can just take a helicopter to base camp, but that's going to add a lot of cost into your trip. And also, I feel like more bragging rights if you actually complete the hike that's part of the trip, right? I don't know. That's just me anyway. Now, base camp sits at 17,650 feet or 500 Th sorry, 5,380 meters, and it's at base camp, either this one or on the, uh, the other side of the mountain, that you need to wait for a while to acclimatize, which I mentioned in the intro. Now, acclimatization is the process of your body becoming accustomed to a new climate or altitude. So basically, when your body goes to a new place, either a colder climate or maybe a hotter climate or a higher altitude when you fly or a lower altitude when you scuba dive, whatever it may be, it needs to adapt. And the adaptation takes time. You can't just ascend from sea level to 17,000 feet at base camp, take a few deep breaths, and then carry on with your life. It's not that simple. You need to let your body adjust to the different environments. Now, it depends on your expedition plan, but people stay anywhere from two weeks to 40 days at base camp waiting for their bodies to acclimatize. The better acclimatized that you are, the more successful your climb will be. Now, that doesn't mean you'll turn into Superman and you won't have any difficulties breathing once you get all the way up, but it will certainly help prevent some more serious illnesses. From base camp, you ascend up to Camp 1, which sits at 19,500 feet, or 5,439 meters. But to get to Camp 1, you need to cross the Kumbu Icefall, spelled K-H-U-M-B-U, for those of you interested, the Kumbu Icefall. Kumbu is a glacier that is constantly moving. It moves three to four feet every day down Mount Everest, which means, again, it is always moving down slope. So having to trek across that is incredibly dangerous. So I watched a documentary about a group of 20 elite Sherpas led by a certifiable badass, by the way, named Namgyal Sherpa, Nam Sherpa, who were on a mission in May 2010 to clean up the trash on the mountain. When they crossed the Kumbu Icefall, they actually triggered a small avalanche, which is a common occurrence. Since you're dealing with a large, moving pack of ice, right, stirring it up and walking on it can trigger avalanches. Not always the huge, rolling ones you see in films, but avalanches nonetheless. I think it even killed a couple of um, people down in base camp. Now, once you cross the Kumbu Icefall, you get to Camp 1. Camp 2 is another 1,500 feet higher, 450 meters. And beyond Camp 2 is the face of the Lhotse Peak. You can kind of see it off in the distance to the right. Um, it's the fourth highest peak in the world, right? And once you scale the route from 2 to 3, by the way, it's very, very vertical. You get to Camp 3, sitting at a whopping 23,500 feet above sea level. That's 7,162 meters. And the way up to Camp 3 is super, super dangerous. In fact, it's so steep and icy all of the time that climbers need to be hooked into ropes as they are climbing it, even when they sleep. You're not doing this trek in one day, by the way. Going from camp to camp takes several days. Sometimes they'll even leave at night so that um, you're doing some of the easier part of, of the climb at night so that they can get good use of the day the next day. 
Now, if you fall <laughs> on your way up to camp three, there's nothing to stop you sliding down to your death, right? It's, it's really hard to dig into the cliff face into the ice, even with the proper shoes, which, by the way, are good climbing boots with crampons on them. A crampon is a, a metal spiky frame that you attach to the bottom of your boots. It gives you better traction. You can dig it into the ice for places to step. Think like super spiky mega cleats, right, that, that you attach to the bottom of your shoe. But people will sometimes die from exhaustion on the climb up to Camp 3 because it's so hard, Camp 3, because it's so hard to get there. But once you survive that, you carry on up to Camp 3 which sits between Everest on one side and Lhotse on the other. Some climbers will do both peaks, but it's not advisable to do it on the same day unless you're a super mountaineer, honestly, because of the dangers of being up that high. Because when you're at Camp 4, it's game time. You're staring up at the last stretch of your hike until you reach the peak of Mount Everest. This is where the death zone begins. The death zone is part of any mountain above 26,000 feet, which is 8,000 meters. Your body cannot acclimatize in the death zone. Not going to happen. It is so high up and there is so little oxygen up there that your cells start to die and your judgment becomes seriously impaired. I repeat, your cells are dying off one by one. The longer you're up there, the more cells that die. You are literally dying when you're in the death zone. <laughs> actively, actively dying. I cannot be more clear about this. Our bodies are not meant to function up there in the death zone. But that's where the highest point in the world is that we can get to without airplanes. Now, for reference, and to help you understand how high up this is, most planes fly around 31,000 feet, right? The death zone is 26,000 feet. You are so high up in the sky that planes would not be that much higher above you. That's, in ooh, that's wild. Now, at sea level, where a lot of people live, the air contains approximately 21% oxygen. For those of you interested, the rest is mostly nitrogen, coming in at around 78%, and then the rest is made up of small, small amounts of carbon dioxide, neon, and hydrogen. But in the death zone, the oxygen levels fall to about 35-40% to 40 of what it is at sea level, meaning it's incredibly hard to breathe. There's just not a lot of oxygen up there. Oh, also, it's freezing <laughs> up there, literally freezing. The temperature never gets above zero degrees Fahrenheit, which is negative 17 Celsius. So that'd be frostbite for any exposed skin, uh, as the blood circulation is pretty poor at that altitude as well. Now, Camp 4, which is the beginning of the South Coal itself, is in the death zone. Oh, and it takes about 10 to 12 hours to go from Camp 4 to the summit. And again, the whole time, you're in the death zone. Like I said earlier, climbers will generally start super late at night, this last little chunk of the trip, so they arrive at the summit early in the morning. And don't forget that you also have to factor in the time of the descent afterwards, which admittedly takes less time to do, but it's still something that needs to be considered. The death zone is where most people climbing Mount Everest die. There's a deadly combination up there of low oxygen levels causing exhaustion and a whole host of other medical problems that I'll go over in a little bit, don't you worry. And, of course, bad weather. Sometimes in a climbing season, there are only three days where the weather is behaving enough, frankly, for climbers to be able to reach the summit. Three days, that's it, that's all you get. Most of the time, it's far too cold and windy, the wind will literally blow you off the face of the mountain, and you'll tumble into an abyss and never be found ever. You will belong to the mountains. In 2010, on that expedition of Sherpas trying to clean up the mountain, one said the following of a body that they were tasked with recovering and bringing back down the mountain. Quote, He did not have a Sherpa or a guide, and he did not have oxygen. He tried to climb Lhotse, and when he reached above 8,000 meters, he fell asleep and never woke up. Just never woke up. This unfortunately, is a common way for people to die on Everest. Sometimes the weather will knock you off the mountain, but a lot of times your body just gives up on you. You run out of steam, your cells die off, your body shuts down, you fall asleep, and you die up there. The lack of oxygen can be extremely fatal to climbers, and with potentially long lines of people waiting to reach the summit, some people stand in the death zone for hours, just waiting for their turn to ascend. And up here in the death zone is where you will find the Rainbow Valley. 
the colorful graveyard of dead bodies who didn't make it off the mountain. Now, typically, mountaineering jackets, pants, and boots will be really bright and colorful. If you wear something basic like white, you'd be making yourself pretty invisible against the white backdrop off the snow, right? So as more people die up there in their colorful clothes, in the aptly named death zone, it adds to the row of corpses lining the way, making a rainbow of colors, a rainbow of dead bodies that you have to climb up and over if you want to summit the mountain. If you ever climb Mount Everest, you will see dozens of dead bodies frozen to the spot, creating colorful patches on the ice and rock on the way up to the summit. It's not in maybe, you, you will, you will see dead bodies if the climbers up there. Maybe from a couple days before, probably from years before, some from decades ago. So anyway, backtrack a bit. From Camp 4, you cross over the South Coal to get to the final leg of the trip, which is named the Hillary Step, named after the first confirmed guy to reach the summit, Sir Edmund Hillary. The Hillary Step sits at 28,800 feet, which is 8,778 meters, and the oxygen levels are so low that every step is difficult and every breath is painful. This, by the way, that last little portion of the trip, that's what you see in all of those pictures that you might have seen of Mount Everest, the lines of hikers making their way up to the top. That's the Hillary Step, the final ascent to the top. Now, dead bodies littered everywhere and frozen in place is a gruesome enough sight. The bodies, too, are mummified because of the cold and the lack of oxygen. It helps preserve them. When the first guy, George Mallory, was found in 1999, he was still scarily preserved. They could read his name on the labels inside his clothes, so his clothes were still relatively in good shape. And though his skin was torn, presumably from where he fell and punctured his legs, like the, the, the calf on the back was kind of torn open, um, it was still in somewhat decent shape. Like, the skin wasn't that awful, considering he's a 75-year-old corpse. But unfortunately, Bodies are not the only gross things that you're going to find up there in the Rainbow Valley, or for that matter, throughout the entire Everest hike, because you're also going to find lots of trash. As people go higher, they start to suffer from the altitude changes, and they make decisions they may not ordinarily make. They might start a trip with the intention of not littering, especially mountaineers and adventurers who are usually such good champions of the environment that they, that they want to climb, right? But when they're at altitude and they think they might die, they're definitely going to be less concerned with leaving behind excess gear or air tanks or water bottles, ropes, netting, backpacks, plastic bags, plastic bottles, food waste, food packaging, giant piles of human trash just discarded at the top. It's disgusting. And human feces is everywhere, too, contaminating the snow that might otherwise be used to melt for water. But if the mountain and the snows are polluted with trash and feces, there won't be enough clean water for the one billion people that rely on the Himalayan meltwaters. Even at the summit, the very peak of our world, you'll find discarded prayer flags, old oxygen tanks, and other man-made items that are abandoned at the peak. The prayer flags, by the way, are those colorful banners that you see strung up at base camp and, and some of the other higher camps as well. They're strings of green, red, white, blue, and yellow pennants that are representative of the Sherpa's Buddhist faith. Green represents water, red represents fire, white is for the clouds, blue for the sky, and yellow for the earth. The idea is that as the wind passes through the prayer flags and up the mountain, it will reach the climbers higher up as it kind of sweeps by. So... That's, that's pleasant. I like that thought. So as more and more people go to the peak, is my point, they leave behind their trash. Lots of liquor bottles, too, by the way, probably for celebrating the achievement of conquering the world, but I wish they'd celebrate by leaving it pristine. Like the old adage, take nothing but pictures, steal nothing but time, leave nothing but footprints. Now, not only do you need a permit to scale Everest, but you also need insurance, since there is a very good chance that you're going to die up there. And because you know I love me some disease history, let's talk about all the horrible, horrible things that can happen to your body up in the death zone. First, there's high altitude sickness, sometimes called mountain sickness. If you travel too high too quickly, you'll get sick. This is why you need to acclimatize at the various camps along the way, and which is why it could take a long time to complete this hike. As you get higher in altitude, breathing becomes more difficult since we now know that there is significantly less oxygen at that height. 
By the way, your age, your sex, your physical fitness has nothing to do with whether or not you will get altitude sickness. Being a super strong gym bro alpha male won't prevent you from getting sick if you climb too high too quickly. And if you did one climb and you were perfectly fine, the next time you might get it too. It, it really is it's nothing to do with your physical form. It's it's kind of like getting the bends when you go scuba diving. You can't, if you don't know this, you can't ascend too quickly after uh, during a dive because you'll get decompression sickness as the nitrogen expands and bubbles out into your bloodstream. If you dive past a certain depth, when you come up, you need to acclimatize for a few minutes at a particular depth to allow your body to adjust before coming up all the way. It's like three minutes at a certain depth, right? At least if you value safety, this is what you do. The symptoms of altitude sickness are headaches, nausea, dizziness, tiredness, and shortness of breath. The best way to prevent altitude sickness is to acclimatize properly and not climb too high too quickly or too high in a single day. There are some meds you can take, like acetazolamide, though the name brand is a bit more recognizable, Diamox. Most cases will also improve if you just descend a little bit and let your body catch up. Breathing in extra oxygen will help, but it won't cure you if you're at height and suffering. It just makes it a little bit more bearable to get lower and rest up. However, there are some complications with high altitude sickness. It can kill you in two primary ways. Pulmonary edema, which is fluid in the lungs, and cerebral edema, which is the swelling of the brain. If your brain swells, you can get seizures, you can get changes to your mental state, or even permanent damage to your nervous system. You do not want to suffer from seizures if you're climbing up the tallest peak in the world. You can also potentially go into a coma, and let me tell you, you're just going to die on the spot. If you're in the death zone, suffering from altitude sickness, and you just pass out up there, you're either going to roll off the cliff, or you're just going to lay there and die from hypothermia. Good old hypothermia. We've talked about that before. You can certainly get that up there too, as it is freezing <laughs> up on the mountain. Now another danger is hypoxia, which is when your body is in a state when it's not getting enough oxygen to maintain what we call homeostasis. Homeostasis is when your body is at equilibrium, so able to function normally and do all the things it needs to do. When you're not getting enough oxygen, simply put, your body cannot function normally. Hypoxia, not getting enough oxygen, can cause your body to shut down. You know where you're really not getting enough oxygen? The death zone? <laughs> there are also significant mental changes that can happen up there. Some are in connection to altitude sickness, hypoxia, hyperthermia. If you listen to my first episode on the Donner Party, you might remember that the snowshoe crew, right, the snowshoe party, they suffered from this as well. They went crazy, they felt all hot even though they were freezing, and they wanted to take off all of their clothes and run away from the group seeking isolation, right? Paradoxical undressing it was called. The point is, your brain chemistry changes when it gets too cold to function or isn't getting enough oxygen. You make weird decisions. Speaking of the Donner Party, you can also get snow blindness on top of the mountain. The sun is stronger the higher up you are, and there's nothing up there but sun and snow, so you can lose your vision either temporarily or permanently, which you definitely don't want to happen when you're on top of a mountain. <laughs> but again, as long as you've got the proper eyewear, you should be fine. Another mental hazard is something called summit fever. It's not a fever in the classic sense of the word, but instead it's this overwhelming desire to get to the summit no matter what, even if it puts you or others at risk. Essentially, you're so high up and getting such little oxygen that you lose the ability to make rational decisions. All you know is that you want to get to the peak by any means necessary. The 2023 climbing season is one of the more deadly ones in recent history. So far, as of late June 2023, there have been 17 deaths. 17 people who wanted the glory and thrill of being at the highest point in our world so badly that they died because of it. And listen, I get it. I'm a thrill seeker too. But it's a serious gamble whether or not you'll even make it off Everest alive. Not for lack of planning or prep, but sometimes just luck. Maybe the weather will kill you. Maybe your body will give up on you, no matter how physically fit you may be. And the result, unfortunately, is just adding to the Rainbow Valley. 
a line of brightly dressed and mummified corpses in the death zone. Corpses that you will sometimes need to step on and scramble over to get to where they couldn't, the summit of Mount Everest. And y'all, even if you just stay at base camp, like you just pay to get to base camp and you have no intention of scaling the peak, you can still see pieces of bodies working their way down the mountain. Literal pieces of corpses tumbling down with the avalanches and moving glaciers. In the various documentaries I watched, the, fa the, the, the camera focused in on some. Like one that was literally just a torso and one arm. The spine was basically sticking out, and at the bottom of the ripped open torso, the spine was all crushed and broken. The ends of the fingers were frozen and frayed. It looked like tassels on a rug or tapestry. It was gross. There was basically no fat left on this climber either, so it was frozen, slowly decaying, yellow tissue stretched thin over bones. And the skin was so dried and papery, at least the part that wasn't like frozen tassels, that it was pretty much see-through. It's pretty gruesome. There are also hands and feet poking out from the rocks where they've rotted into the soil, but with climate change, the snow that would usually cover a lot of these bodies over time has melted, so the corpses are exposed. And as a result of being exposed to air and with more heat, they're also starting to rot and make base camps smell like death, literal death. Bacteria are growing and thriving, so the water sources also are becoming fouler over time. And that doesn't even factor in the feces. That's just the bacteria being exposed from these rotting corpses. And I know I said pieces of bodies. There are no predators up there. These are just pieces that are being ripped from the avalanche and from the winds and from the fall damage. Since 1922, the first successful summit of Mount Everest, more than 300 people have died. 193 climbers, 125 Sherpas. So before we talk about the potential solutions to the trash and bodies problem plaguing Mount Everest, let's meet a few of the climbers who died trying to cement their name in history as one of the few who reached the summit of the world. I'll go chronological with this one. I've got three for you. Some bodies who have been frozen up there for so long that they've actually become landmarks for other climbers, which is disturbing. As in, you know, you, you're on the right path going to the summit because you'll see these bodies. Landmarks. First, there's a German woman named Hannelore Schmatz, the first woman, by the way, to die on Everest in 1979. Hanalore went on a trip with six other climbers and five Sherpas, and they all reached the summit. Great. But on the descent, they got stuck. Most managed to get back down to base camp, but Hanalore and an American mountaineer named Ray Janae couldn't get back down, and they also had one Sherpa with them. They got stuck in the death zone during a snowstorm and had to spend the night there. I've talked at length about how dangerous it is up there and how you can very easily just fall into a coma and die. And that's what happened to Ray Janae. Um, since he spent so long in the death zone, and again, your cells are literally dying when you're in there, they're beyond exhausted. Hanalore lost her balance and fell, and she died on her way down. Ray Janae died overnight. The Sherpa, I think, got back down. And Hanalore is still up there today, in the death zone, over 8,000 meters up, preserved in ice, with her eyes open, watching over the other climbers. She's drifted a bit over the years because of the strong winds that push everything around up there, but she's still there. Oh, and side story. In 1984, a policeman named Yojendra Thapa went up there with the intention of recovering her body, but he, too, fell to his death. Cool cultural note, by the way, because the Sherpa are really fascinating. The Sherpa believe that until a body has been cremated or given other burial rites, the, stole, the soul stays restless near the body, searching for a path to the next life. They're Buddhists, right? So they believe in reincarnation, the idea that your soul is reborn into another life when you die. What you reincarnate into depends on what you did in this lifetime, but that's a story for another day. So all of the bodies the Sherpa find up there, they believe, are still attached to their spirits who are stuck up in the mountain in limbo. Next, after Hanalore, we have Green Boots. <laughs> Green Boots is a landmark because he's tucked away in a small alcove, like a little cave, up in the death zone, visible on the climb up the mountain of the South Coal Route. He wears a bright red jacket, blue pants, and as you may have guessed from the name, <laughs> neon green boots. He also has two 
orange oxygen tanks empty on the ground next to his body. So very colorful. You can definitely see him. He's believed to be an Indian climber named Sewang Paljor, who went missing in 1996. And he's preserved pretty well because, again, he's in the death zone. It's a, not a lot of oxygen, real cold. It's good for preserving bodies. And finally, in 1998, an American mountaineer named Francis Arsentiev went climbing with her husband, Sergi. Uh, the two wanted to reach the summit without using supplemental oxygen tanks, which is an awful idea, by the way, because, again, there is very little oxygen up there. Like Hanalor Schmatz and her group, Francis and Sergi did reach the summit, but had trouble on the way down. Francis fell and injured herself. Her husband, Sergi, was ahead of her and did reach camp, but when Francis never showed up behind him, he went back up there looking for her, fell, and died. Francis actually survived her initial fall, but couldn't really move. When you're all the way up there and you've injured yourself, it's not like you can call an ambulance to come get you, right? You either find a way to hike out yourself, or maybe, if you can't move, you'll get lucky and a Sherpa or another visitor will find you and carry you out. But also, like, who can spare another 150 to 200 pounds of injured human when you're at the highest point of the planet, just barely surviving as it is? Other climbers did find Francis up there alive, by the way, who was suffering from frostbite by this point and fall damage, and she was also struggling to breathe. She stayed alive, somehow, for three days, laying in the same spot before dying. She was laying on her back with her arms crossed over her when she died, and a later climber called her Sleeping Beauty because she looked a bit like Sleeping Beauty, right, in her, in her little coffin thing. Now, she's just known as Sleeping Beauty today. Um, she wore a bright purple climbing suit and red shoes, and she's lying in an area that's mostly rocks instead of snow. And she serves as a precautionary tale told to potential climbers about how important it is to bring oxygen with you when you climb. It helps keep the the high altitude sickness at bay, and it allows you to be able to get back down the mountain safely. Now, some of you may be wondering at this point, can't the Sherpas, or others who could stomach moving dead bodies, can't they just move the bodies and bring them back down to Lukla airstrip to be cremated in probably Kathmandu, the capital, right? No, actually. You can't just pick up a corpse and move it, <laughs> legally. Nepalese laws prohibit the Sherpas from removing corpses from the mountain unless they've been granted powers to do it by the government or the family has allowed it to happen, like in the cases of Gianni Goltz and Sergi Duganov. In 2010, a team of 20 elite Sherpas went on that cleanup mission to the peak, I've mentioned it before, and they made a documentary about it, by the way, if you'd rather watch that. It's called Death Zone, Cleaning Mount Everest, and it's narrated by Sir Patrick Stewart. <laughs> but it was shot mostly by the Sherpas themselves. Now, on this trip, they were also asked and authorized to bring back to Kathmandu the two bodies I just mentioned. Swiss climber Gianni Goltz, who died two years previously on the South Coal while, ironically, filming a documentary about the Sherpa, and the Russian climber, Sergei Duganov, who actually died only a few days before the, the, the Sherpa cleanup crew reached base camp. Talk about timing. But Sergi's family wanted his body back, so they authorized them, through the government, to recover and return it. Sergi's body was found lying a few feet away from his tent at 8,016 meters, 26,300 feet. He was only a few steps away from safety, but exhaustion took over and he fell backwards. And again, that's above 8,000 meters, so it's in the death zone. Though half encased in ice, his body was highly visible because he wore a bright orange suit with red accents. Namgyal Sherpa, the leader of the Sherpa cleanup team, spent two hours alone digging his body out of the ice. He then had to drag this ice-heavy body back down to Camp 3, where the rest of his team was waiting out some bad weather. This guy, Namgyal, certifiable legend, by the way. Absolute hero. When the rest of the team found Namgyal dragging his body back, here's what he said, quote, I can't speak. I have done lots of expeditions, but it wasn't like this. I lost the power of my hands. I was alone bringing the dead body down. The day was so bad, all of my friends left me. There was no safe place to store the dead body, so I had to drag the body with me to a safe place. And after doing that, I got so tired. You guys came here to find me. Thanks for that. I have never cried in my life before. In this expedition, I have faced a lot more difficulties than I have thought. I thought I would stop at Camp 3, but everyone from Camp 1 encouraged me to keep going. Base Camp and everyone from Kathmandu, they called me. They encouraged me a lot. 
Thank you, guys, for coming to find me. I had a very little bit of energy left, and when I descended 500 meters below, then totally, my hand doesn't work. I tried to have oxygen, but it didn't work because I already got too tired. End quote. And not only does that show you how seriously badass Namgyal Sherpa is, but it highlights how important it is to prepare properly. This cleanup team didn't acclimatize properly because they were trying to get up the mountain quickly, and Namgyal suffered from this and almost died as a result. He was the most experienced climber on his team, but he struggled immensely with how little oxygen there is up there. He did recover the Russian climber, Sergei Duganov, and later the team also found and recovered Swiss climber, Gianni Goltz. Absolute legends, these Sherpa. Namgyal, from this 2010 trip, dedicated the rest of his life to cleaning up trash on Mount Everest. They were actually pretty successful in getting rid of like 75% of all the trash that was up there. Sadly, Namgyal Sherpa died on May 16th, 2013, a couple years later, while descending from the summit on the north side of Mount Everest. He had succumbed, as so many tur tourists and Sherpa before him, to high altitude sickness. So, one thing to help limit the additions to the Rainbow Valley would be to restrict the number of permits issued for people to climb Everest, right? Let's look at the 2019 season for an example. So there's a really famous picture from that year, which many of you have probably seen, actually. It shows a line of climbers waiting to reach the summit from the south side, the Nepalese side. The peak is there in the picture, and then it's an absolutely jam-packed line of people waiting their turn to scale up that last little bit of the mountain. And there was a lot of criticism, by the way, because Nepal issued 381 permits that year. And when you factor in all the Sherpas that came with them, it means that more than 820 people tried to reach the, Mount, uh, the summit of Mount Everest in 2019. Think about all the trash that those people left behind. But on the other hand, Nepal is a small mountain country. It exists entirely on the Himalayas. It's currently ranked as the poorest country in South Asia, with approximately a quarter of all Nepalis living below the poverty line. One of its principal means of making money, both as a government and for the individuals living there, is through tourism. The sheer number of foreigners who flock to the Himalayas every year and go to base camp, or get a permit to ascend Mount Everest or Lhotse, so it's hard for them to turn down the opportunity to make money by restricting the number of permits it gives out. The trade-off, though, is more death and more pollution. Also, remember that you can only scale Mount Everest at certain times when the weather is good, right? So everyone with a permit tends to rush and go at the same time. And I've already told you many times that your body is literally dying when you get to the death zone above 8,000 meters. So imagine now being stuck in a queue, no way to move faster, people probably actually dying in front of you while you wait your turn. The longer you stand around in line, the sicker you're going to get. You'll get high altitude sickness. Your brain will be starved of oxygen. Your cells will start dying off. You'll make irrational decisions. Your lungs might just crap out and you'll collapse. And if you're in a line, you might even cause the people around you to fall as well. It's a mess. On one hand, Nepal wants to make money off the climbers who come here. But the more climbers there are, the more trash those visitors accumulate, and the worse the environment becomes. Like I said earlier, one billion people rely on the waters that flow from the Himalayas, and if we're polluting that water source, literally from the top of it, with trash and corpses and feces, then we're dooming one-eighth of the population of our planet to a dirty water supply. Do you want to drink someone's poop water? No, I didn't think so. Each climber who ascends Everest has to pay a $4,000 deposit. It's a trash deposit. You'll get the deposit back if you bring back at least 18 pounds of trash, which is 8 kilos for my non-American listeners. That's what they estimate each climber produces as they go. So basically, bring back your trash. More, if possible. But climbers have just started factoring in that $4,000 deposit into the cost of their trip, so they don't even worry about bringing trash back down which means that Sherpas, like the late great Namgyal Sherpa, have to risk their lives to clean up after you. In that 2010 trip up there to clean up some trash, one of the Sherpas said, quote, The Himalayas are so polluted, it is our responsibility to clean them. This will take time. The Nepal government and major industries should support this. However, as the youth, we can make this a success. We can clean our main water source. This will allow our whole nation to have access to clean water. 
Everyone has the ability and the responsibility to do something about that. We do not care who is responsible for this trash, we just want to clean it up. End quote. Another, Dedendi Sherpa, said, How did the garbage from all around the world get here? In this high season, there are already 30 to 35 expedition groups here. Imagine the amount of trash generated. People expect cleaning crews to come every year, so they just leave their garbage on the mountain. I've seen my own people throw trash on the mountain. I've seen it myself. I've done it too, because life is so risky in this environment. We are only able to carry our breath with us. End quote. But remember, and that was back in 2010, it's not just trash polluting Mount Everest, but human bodies, too. A Canadian filmmaker who's reached the summit of Mount Everest four times, Elias Saikali, said the following of his trip to the top in 2019, quote, I cannot believe what I saw up there. Death, carnage, chaos, lineups, dead bodies on the route, and in tents at Camp 4, people who I tried to turn back who ended up dying, people being dragged down, walking over bodies, everything you read in the sensational headlines all played out on our summit night. There were 200 plus climbers making their way to the summit. I came across a deceased climber. That person's body was fixed to an anchor point between two safety lines, and every single person that was climbing towards the summit had to step over that human being. It's difficult for people at sea level, who are not mountaineers, who have never been above 8,000 meters, to understand that particular scenario. When you're on Everest, and you're in the death zone, and you can barely think, it becomes a very complicated situation, and you realize in your mind that your fate could be the same. And with a lineup pushing you up the mountain, there is nothing you can do. You really have no choice but to carry on. End quote. Our planet deserves better. Mount Everest deserves better. The Sherpa, who have to clean up after us, deserve better. For the 2023 season, Nepal issued... 478 permits. It's the largest number of permits ever issued, breaking the previous record of 408 in 2021. Nepal generated $5.8 million from permits this year. I guess back in 2021, people got bored during COVID and decided to find other ways of not being able to breathe. Now, for 2023, not all of those 478 people and their Sherpas, don't forget, it's not just 478, it's all the people that accompany you, not all of them actually reached the summit, or even went, but it's still a massive amount of traffic coming to and from the mountains. And with the influx of climbers this year, came record numbers of trash, too, with reports coming out that Camp 4 was absolutely littered with filth. Apparently, the base camp was also plagued with theft, people just stealing stuff out of each other's tents. Here's what guide Tenzi Sherpa said of the following, said, said uh, of what he saw in this year's climbing season, quote, the dirtiest camp I have ever seen. We can see lots of tents, empty oxygen bottles, steel bowls, spoons, sanitation pads, paper, a lot of things, end quote. He also added that many climbing companies who run the various Western and Nepalese-based expeditions cut their logos off of the discarded items they left behind to prevent being found out and fined. That is just shameful. Absolutely shameful behavior. I'm getting really angry about this. I, I really just wanted to gross you out about all the mountain of poop and, and the dangers of climbing Everest and the dead bodies, but honestly, I hope you're as mad as I am about the state we human beings leave our planet in. It's just awful. I haven't even mentioned proper cannibalism in a few episodes, and there isn't any. I don't have any to share with you today. So I hope you're proud of me, or maybe you're disappointed that I didn't do cannibalism. I'm sure I'll do it in another story soon. Don't you worry, with some good old-fashioned people eating. Thanks for joining me for this episode of A Popular History of Pop Unpopular Things. My name is Kelly Beard, and I hope you've enjoyed the story of the Mount Everest Rainbow Valley. Thank you for supporting my podcast, and if you haven't already checked out my other episodes, go have a listen. If you like freezing cold hikes with certain death and a good helping of cannibalism, go listen to my first episode on the Donner Party, or maybe even the Lost Franklin Expedition. Be sure to follow my podcast, available wherever you listen, so you know when new episodes are dropped. Following really helps my podcast grow, so I appreciate your support. And stay tuned for more episodes to get a popular history of unpopular things.